um, very happy to have uh, Jeremy Oakley, who's a professor in here in the Department of Statistics. So Jeremy and I, we were like postdocs together, I don't know, lecturers together, We've been in Sheffield uh, for a long time together. Jeremy did his PhD with Tony O'Hagan, who, um, as sort of, say, Chris Williams and Carl Rasmussen are the sort of leading people who introduced Gaussian process to machine learning. Many years before that, Tony O'Hagan was a big proponent of them in the statistical community. And uh, uh, Jeremy leads um, groups in that and has done a lot of work with Gaussian processes in computer code simulation and uh, uh, as an excellent person to provide the second introduction, giving you a different perspective on Gaussian processes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I've actually gone a little bit off scripts for my talk. Um, as we've snuck the words uncertainty quantification into the title of this uh, workshop, um, I thought I'd start by actually just giving an introduction to what, what we mean by uncertainty quantification. So this is sort of a, a talk in two parts. The first part, a uh, general introduction to the field of UQ, and then the second part, I will sort of do a, um, uh, an introduction to GPs as well. So I'll do an alternative take on Neil's talk, but that part will be a little bit shorter. Um, uh, the two topics go very well together. So if you work in UQ, then you'll see lots of ways that you can uh, um, make use of Gaussian processes. So anyone working in UQ should be interested in Gaussian processes. Um, if you haven't heard the, the UQ phrase before, but you do any sort of work with engineers, scientists, social scientists, if you're working with people who have knowledge of the underlying physical systems that you're modeling, then you'll find that these UQ issues crop up. So hopefully lots of you will find this um, interesting and relevant. If you're doing things that are completely empirical, completely data-driven, so perhaps you're, you know, you're just given data sets and told to get on with it, maybe you're working for some, I don't know, large on, online retailer or somebody like that, um, perhaps it's not quite so relevant, so you can, uh, you can uh, switch off for the first part. Okay, so what do we mean by UQ? Um, well, some of us at least uh, think of it as a sort of a collection of statistical problems that you encounter when you're working with what we call a complex mechanistic, deterministic, or computer models. Um, and I'll say a bit, a bit more about that in a, in a moment. So this is something that sort of statisticians have been interested in uh, for a while now, and it goes on to different names. So design and analysis of computer experiments, Bayesian analysis of computer code outputs. But um, more recently, there's been interest from the applied uh, maths community, and they tend to turn this uh, badge as UQ. And we sort of converged on UQ as a, as a name for sort of a, a general range of problems associated with a particular sort of class of models. And lots of the sorts of analyses that we do in, in UQ can be done with Gaussian processes. So there's lots of interest in Gaussian processes in the, in the UQ community. So we start with this object of interest, what we'll refer to as a computer model. So it's a function, f, that takes some inputs, x, and some out, produces some outputs, y. Uh, and to distinguish between computer model and all the other sorts of models that we might be talking about, we're going to, from now on, we're going to call these sorts of models simulators. Okay? So often this sort of simulator will be quite a sort of a complex function, so perhaps not available in closed form, so we're relying on a computer to implement, to implement it for us. And uh, these, these simulators are built from some understanding of the physical process. So quite often you build one precisely because you cannot do the physical, you can't do the physical experiments and get the input output data yourself. So you're building a simulator to replicate a physical process because you can't directly experiment on your physical process. Um, it doesn't have to be, but often these, these simulators are deterministic. So if you plug in the same value of x twice, you will observe the same value of y coming out twice. And then we refer to a computer experiment as opposed to a physical experiment of testing out different input values and seeing what happens to the output. Okay, perhaps you're trying to um, optimize or you're trying to um, uh, find perhaps input settings that look robust in some sense or, or something like that. And then we, we, when we refer to a, a run, or a single run, we mean choosing one value of x um, and observing your corresponding output y. So just a few examples of the sorts of simulators that we might be talking about. So this is a, a simple simulator for rainfall run runoff. So we're looking at sort of flow of water from rain to soil to river to groundwater, et cetera. 
So we have different compartments. We have different rates of transfer between the compartments. So the, the underlying model might be represented by a system of differential equations that describe um, transfer of water from one compartment to another. Then your computer solves those numeric, uh, differential equations numerically and produces outputs, such as the rate at which water's flowing out the river or something like that, given different input values. Okay. Um, Another example, perhaps a complex finite em uh, element model. So this is an uh, example of a model that simulates uh, the machining of a piece of metal. So your inputs might be various characteristics of the tool, um, the speed at which you're going to cut the metal with, uh, and, and so on, uh, characteristics of the material that you're cutting. And then your uh, simulator might produce a whole bunch of different outputs, perhaps forces and temperatures experienced by both the tool and the, uh, the, um, the workpiece um, at different locations. Okay. Um, so we're going to be looking at uncertainty in these sorts of models. Um, when we talk about UQ, we don't really mean uncertainty in purely empirical statistical models. So if someone just gave you a data set, measure, uh, observations of different variables, so a mortality rate measures of this, this data set uh, relates to mortality and education and pollution and so on at different cities. So you might try and empirically build a model that relates one of the variables to the other purely empirically without any understanding of the physical process. And we tend to sort of not class that as a, class that as a UQ problem. We tend to sort of concentrate on these uh, uh, more deterministic models that are based on sort of an underlying knowledge of the process. OK, so let's sort of start with the first problem of uncertainty. So we've got our simulator set up, and perhaps it allows us to vary inputs that are controllable um, in the real world. Okay? But maybe buried in that code, there are other parameters, um, coefficients, and so on, that we might be um, perhaps uncertain about, sort of hardwired into the model. So we'll define our x to include all the numerical quantities, in a sense, that you need to run your model. So things that you might be able to control, but also other quantities that might relate to particular physical constants or, or something like that. And then we suppose that in the application that you're using your simulator, we think of there being a sort of a true value. Okay? So a true value that may be uncertain. And so what you want to know is if capital X represents this sort of true but unknown input value that I should be using. Capital Y would be, what would my simulator give me if I can run, them, run it at those true, true settings? What's my uncertainty about the output if I'm uncertain about the input? So I want to sort of think about propagating uncertainty about model inputs through the model and quantify my uncertainty about the model outputs. So um, my own preference would be we would do this probabilistically, so we would come up with some sort of probability distribution that quantifies our uncertainty about the, the inputs that are unknown to us. And then we want to try and work out what, what's the corresponding probability distribution of the uh, output quantity. Okay? And you might do this with Monte Carlo. Um, so you might generate a sample of random inputs from your distribution. You propagate them through the model. So you run the model at each sample out, uh, input to get a sample output. Okay? And what makes this problem harder is that um, we might have a computation expensive simulator F. So to obtain one of these um, output points might be taking many hours, days, even months of uh, computer time. Okay? So how can we learn about the output just uncertainty efficiently if we've got a, a computation expensive model? Okay? So um, you might already guess one technique that we can use to do this. Um, uh, and we'll talk about this later, we might consider using a Gaussian process as a way of coming up with a, a fast approximation of f. Okay? So that's one problem in UQ, and um, we'll come back to this, but one example where we might use a Gaussian process to, 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 to do the computational work. OK, then sort of moving on from that basic sort of uncertainty propagation, um, we can sort of dig in a little bit more detail. Um, so something that we uh, refer to as probabilistic sensitivity analysis. So same setup as before. We've got an uncertain input, x, and we're interested in what would the simulator give me if I could discover the value of x, plug it in, 
and see what the output is. Okay? So we've got an uncertain input, interested in the uh, output uncertainty. And then this sensitivity analysis problem, we've got a, a collection of uncertain inputs. We've got a vector of uncertain inputs, x. And we'd like to discover which of these are most influential, in some sense, in driving the uncertainty about y. So there's sort of two scenarios here. One might be that we might invest an effort, we might collect some data to learn about some of these inputs. And if we're going to do that, what do we learn about to best reduce our out output uncertainty? Or we might have a system where some of these x's are sort of um, varying from one occasion to the next. Perhaps we can control that variation. So perhaps I can sort of reduce variation in one of these x's. How would I best reduce the variation in the output? Okay. So one of the approaches that we take to this is well, let's sort of uh, partition our input. So we're going we're gonna to have a, a particular input of interest, xi, and then these will be all the other inputs that we won't concern, consider for the time being. And then one measure that we use to quantify the importance of this input um, is this, this, this term here. So what we've got here is the conditional expectation of the output if you knew xi, so you're averaging over the conditional distribution of all the other inputs, and then you look at how does this conditional expectation vary as xi varies. So it's the variance of the conditional expectation. And the reason for considering this is what it's telling you is it's giving you an expected reduction in variance. So I've got my variance now with no information, no extra information. I've got my what I ex would expect the variance to be if I could discover the true value of that input. Okay? And so this quantity is telling us the reduction, the expected reduction we would get if we were to first discover the true value of that input xi. Okay? That's just one particular measure that we might use. Now, um, again, uh, this is another sort of application where people are interested in Gaussian processes because these things can be quite uh, computationally expensive to, to obtain. And it is possible to speed up the computation with, with Gaussian processes. Um, I'm going to commit a heresy now and say that actually we don't always recommend it. There are uh, better ways of doing this for this, for this particular problem. Okay? Um, but certainly um, uh, Gaussian processes can be useful for, for doing the, the computation here. Um, so that's just sort of a um, kind of an illustration of what's going on. So with these sort of variance-based measures, there's two ingredients. You've got your input uncertainty, which I'm representing by um, these, these red PDFs at the bottom here. And then this is your conditional expectation of the output given that particular input. Okay? And these variance-based measures feed the two things together. So comparing my input uncertainty, I'm more uncertain about x2 than I am about x1. I've got a flatter distribution. Okay? But in terms of the conditional expectation, you've kind of got this stronger relationship between the outputs and the inputs. Okay? And so what we're capturing with the variance space measure is this, is this variance in this conditional expectation. Okay? So you can see you've got more variance in the conditional expectation here than you have here. So even though I've got less uncertainty about x1 than I have about x2, if I could choose which of those inputs to learn, I'd put my effort into learning this one because it'll give me a bigger expected reduction in, in variance overall. Um, just a little um, uh, example that I, I like to talk about when, in this context. When you're doing this, you have to think quite carefully, have to think very carefully about your choice of input distributions. And a lot of the literature um, just presents this with a, with a uniform distribution across the range okay? um, without deliberately trying to think about how you do it. But it does matter. So here's a nice little example. Suppose you've got a one-dimensional function so a single function of an input x. Okay? We've got the scenario where we've got an uncertain input x. And I'm interested in the distribution of y. And I'm going to put a uniform distribution on that, on that input x. Okay? So in this case, you can derive your variance of y. Okay? So from this, um, uh, y is just e to the minus a uniform random variable. Okay? So you can derive it in terms of b. And then what you can spot is that as you make b larger, so as you, as you have become more uncertain about your input, your variance about the output actually goes down. So you might be tempted to think that specifying lots of uncertainty on, on the input is a conserv conservative thing to do. It doesn't always follow. Okay? 
increasing your variance of x, increasing b increases the variance of x, but it will decrease the variance of y. So to see what's going on, so that's my function. So kind of the interesting stuff is all happening down here. And as I become more and more uncertain about my inputs, I put less and less mass on that interesting part of the input space. And so if I think I'm being conservative by giving a nice wide range um, on the inputs, I'm not being conservative about my output uncertainty because I'm actually putting more and more probability over to the stuff where nothing's going on. So you have to think about these things carefully. Um, so uh, here's a, just an example of the sort of things that this uh, tells you. Um, so this is a, a simulator that Glaxo SmithKline developed, um, looking at what happens if a particular vaccine um, is introduced uh, into a, a population. Um, so some details of the simulator that aren't particularly important. It has, uh, it models different tracks, different disease stages over di different age classes, and tracks people moving between different classes and so on. Got a whole bunch of inputs into this model, um, which would be uncertain. Things like you know, how well does the vaccine actually work? How's it going to reduce your risk of infection and so on? Whole bunch of outputs to do with the the, the uh, passage of the, of the the characteristics of the disease over time in, in the population. So they did a, a sensitivity analysis. They varied nine inputs and they looked at um, different eight eight thousand two hundred different simulator runs. We sort of did an extended version where uh, we had uh, 20 inputs uh, using a small number of simulator runs. Um, so this is the sort of thing that you get out of this analysis. So you've got your 20 different inputs, and for each one, uh, you calculate what would the expected reduction be if you were to learn that input before predicting the output. So that's the, um, the blue bar there. And then the red bar corresponds to something I haven't talked about, sort of we call total effects, where you include interactions. So you have some inputs, these ones down here, for example, that um, even if you're very uncertain about, they really do nothing in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, the model, in the simulator itself. They don't contribute to the variance on their own. They don't contribute to the variance through interactions with other inputs. So you have some inputs that uh, are not at all influential, some inputs that don't do very much on their own but do quite a lot in combination with others, so it's their interactions that are important. Um, but in fact, the most important part of this story is that um, these inputs here were all ones that GSK had fixed in their early analysis. So you had a, you've got a model, you've got various uncertain quantities, someone's estimated them, plugged them into their, their code and then forgotten about them. When you then go back and look at the uncertainty, they turn out to be very influential. Okay? I expect there are lots of examples of this where there's kind of um, buried estimates in, in, in code that turn out to be quite influential when you go back to the uncertainty in them. Um, and then just uh, briefly, kind of a, a, a variation on this. So rather than looking at variance, we might look at decision uncertainty. So we might have um, a situation where we're choosing between one or two different actions, and our computer simulator is perhaps directly outputting a payoff for each action, or something that we can convert into a payoff for a utility. So these lines are showing us um, expected utilities, expected payoffs, conditional on a particular input into our model, our simulator. And we've got our um, P PDF of the input down here. So this is a scenario where we're, um, we're quite, un we're not, we've got some uncertainty about what our payoff is going to be, but we're pretty confident that for any value of that input, we still think um, this one here, uh, this uh, D1 option, is going to give us the highest expected payoff. So we don't, we're not, sure exactly what the payoff is going to be, but we're confident that whatever the input value it takes, we would go for that first, um, that first decision. Okay? So that's a, an example where uh, the input is un uninfluential. It doesn't change your action, so it's not worth learning about it before you make your decision. But if our PDF looked like this, we've got more uncertainty. Now it's possible that if we discover that this input is, is up here, we might switch from decision one to decision two and we do quite a bit better. So that's a, an input that's more influential, important, because it, learning it might change the action that you take. OK, so just a um, uh, quick plug for Thursday. Um, so on Thursday, we've got two parallel sessions. Um, in the morning, uh, myself and Mark Strong will be giving a, a workshop um, uh, on sort of sensitivity analysis methods. So we'll, we'll go more into the theory. Uh, we'll show you how to do sort of computation.
a little bit about how you might construct input distributions from expert judgment, um, and then um, uh, we'll sort of do implementation using R. Um, however, there's not going to be any Gaussian processes. So if you come here specifically to learn about Gaussian processes, don't come to this. But if you're interested in the sensitivity analysis problem, we're going to um, um, uh, give you more of a sort of a grounding on how to do it. Um, and as I said, it, it just turns out that often there are sort of faster, simpler ways than using GPs for that particular problem. OK, so um, up until now, we're just um, analyzing the simulator on its own. But now things get a bit more difficult because we're going to bring in reality, the real world. Okay. Um, so I'll sort of give a, a motivating example. And this is kind of one of the kind of key sort of statistical papers on this sort of particular uh, calibration problem. So the scenario is that you've had a nuclear accident, so an accidental release from a, a point source, and you've got a, a simulator that will predict what the deposition of radionuclides is going to be in the surrounding area. Okay? So uh, in your simulator, you would specify what we call the control inputs. So the control inputs just might be the coordinates that you're looking at. Um, and then we'll have what we call the calibration inputs, which are things you don't know, which is how much stuff was released, um, the concentration released from that accident in the first place. Okay? So you've got this model. And then together with your simulator, you've got physical data. So somebody might go to a particular location. At that location, you know what the, the control variables are. You know what your coordinates are. So you take a, a measurement of the thing you're predicting, the true deposition, at that location. So people would go around different locations and take physical measurements. Okay? But when you go to a location, you take a measurement, you don't directly observe what the initial release was. Okay? So you don't get all the things you need to be able to run your model. So what you want to do is be able to predict what the deposition would be anywhere using both your simulator and that physical data. So you want to fit together that two, those two sources of information. Okay? So one of the problems is what do you choose for this unknown calibration input? Okay? And rather more difficult problem is assuming the simulator is not perfect, it's not describing reality perfectly, um, uh, what do you do? So here's just a little example of the problems of trying to work with an imperfect simulator. So let's say I'm going to do an experiment, and I want to measure this g acceleration due to Earth's gravity. Okay? So um, the way I'm, I've decided I'm going to do this is I'm going to go to my office, and I'm going to drop an object out the window. So I'm going to drop a tennis ball. Um, I know I've measured the distance from my office to the ground. Okay? And I'm going to time how long it takes um, uh, the, the, to, to hit the ground from when I've dropped it. Okay? And then I'm going to have a very simple simulator which just assumes constant acceleration due to gravity. Okay? So um, you can think of the input as being the height at which you're dropping the tennis ball. We've got this unknown calibration parameter, which is that acceleration due to gravity. That's the thing I'd like to learn. And then the output of that simulator is the time it would take to hit the ground. Okay? So I've got this sort of simulator of the process, and then I've got my physical measurements. Okay? Um, now, I suppose that as I'm dropping the tennis ball and recording it, I can't record those times perfectly, so I'm going to take replicates. I'm going to keep repeating the experiment, keep taking the measurement, and that should eliminate the error. Okay? What's going to happen is because the, the, the model that I'm using to calibrate, to work out what that, to infer what that G is, is wrong. Okay, it's not a perfect description. I haven't factored in air resistance. Um, I'm going to calibrate to the wrong value of G, but I go, I'm going to become more and more certain the more data I get. Okay? So as I take lots and lots of observations, I'm going to end up with a very tight posterior distribution, but one that is centered around the wrong value. Okay? Because I've calibrated a model that was not right in the first place. So this is one of the problems of um, what happens when we try and uh, combine these sort of imperfect models with, with physical data. So the um, uh, model for sort of doing this that uh, Kenny and Hagen suggested, so what we've got here is these are our physical observations, things that we are actually observing. 
and we're going to include some measurement errors um, in those physical observations. Then we're going to say that here we've got our computer simulator okay, run at the true value of the calibration inputs. So that might be uncertain to us. And we might have a multiplicative constant at, um, at the front. Some authors um, ignore that term. But then we're going to introduce this extra term here, which is what we call the discrepancy. Okay? And it's this extra term that is trying to account for the fact that that simulator is not a perfect representation of reality. Okay? Um, now, as it happens, um, we're going to model delta with a Gaussian process. And we actually, if, if f is computationally expensive, we've got another Gaussian process here. So, again, lots of um, uh, Gaussian process applications going on here. Um, now, this whole framework can be quite uh, controversial, particularly with, with modelers who sometimes uh, don't like it. And I was at a, a conference a while ago where um, someone else was, was presenting this, um, and they got quite an angry reaction. Um, and someone said, this is awful. Um, you improve your models with better physics. You don't just arbitrarily throw in some normal distribution to do that. Now, that's kind of a whole storm in a teacup, really. Um, we're not suggesting that you can forget science and do everything with Gaussian processes. Okay? Perhaps Neil would like to. Perhaps that's what Neil, Neil's going to do when he um, goes off to Amazon. But anyway, we're not suggest no, one, no one's suggesting that you, you're not going to improve your model. This, is a, this, this model is all about how do you use the simulator in front of you now. Okay? When you're talking about improving a model with better physics, you're talking about months, years of development. So these are things that work on completely different timescales. So this is simply, what do you do with the model in front of you when it's not perfect? Okay? And you can't just put some better physics into it instantly. That, that, yeah, that's a, a different process. So this sort of extra discrepancy term is important um, because it can stop us um, becoming certain about the wrong value, as I, as I was in that, that gravity example. And it can stop us coming up with spuriously precise um, uh, simulated, simulated predictions. Okay? We've got to somehow account for the fact that these simulators are not perfect when we're, we're, when we're predicting with them. OK, just another little detail about this that's quite important. So we have sort of two inputs. We can kind of class our, our, our inputs under, under two, two, two types. So we can talk about an observable calibration input. So this is something that has physical meaning, something that you might be able to learn about completely separately of whether your um, uh, simulator exists or not. Okay? And then we have what we call tuning inputs. And these are things that are just really, really fudge factors. They're, they're, um, they're there to sort of help the simulator fit the data. So they might have, rather than true values, they simply have a best value. What, what's the value that works best? But they don't have physical meaning because they don't really have any definition outside of, uh, outside of the simulator. And the sort of um, Kennedy O'Hagan model has got very, uh, become very popular for doing this sort of calibration. It's kind of really intended for interpolating physical observations. Okay? But if you're trying to actually learn about observable, physically meaningful calibration parameters, or you're trying to extrapolate, then um, uh, you've got to be very careful uh, about how you specify um, that, that, that discrepancy and just sort of naive zero mean Gaussian processes might not be up to the job. Um, uh, and there's a nice paper that kind of talks about even within this, this context of this model how things can go wrong when you're actually trying to learn about physical, um, uh, physical input parameters. OK, uh, and then sort of the final topic I'll cover is a sort of related problem. Uh, it's a slightly different way of doing calibration. And you're actually going to hear about uh, uh, this more um, over the next few days. I think there's a, a practical session on it on Wednesday and um, maybe some talks as well on, on, on Thursday. So again, this is calibration again, but it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. So again, we're trying to find an input x such that our simulator output is close to some physical observation. Okay? But before we kind of try and get into the more sort of, uh, if you like, detailed probabilistic inference, what we found it's very helpful to do is to first come up with ways of throwing away parts of input space where you can be confident that you're not going to find a good match. And in particular, discarding parts of the space that have a bad match is easier than finding parts of the space that have a good match. 
Um, if we're working with a, a computationally ex uh, uh, expensive simulator, we're going to use a Gaussian process. And again, I'll, I'll come back to this word emulator later on. Okay. But basically, what we do is use this measure of called, which we call implausibility. So what you're looking at here is here, for a particular candidate input value, you've got your uh, uh, physical observation that you're trying to match. Okay. Here you might have either the simulator output itself or an approximation of it if it's computationally expensive. So this is something that might come out of a Gaussian process. And then you scale that by the bottom. If you've used an approximation of f, again with the Gaussian process, then you can have a variance in there. We'll have an observation error. So we'll include that. And we'll include some model discrepancy, the fact that even if we plugged in the right value of x, we might not exactly get the right value, the, the, uh, the observed value of the outputs. And when you're dealing with sort of multivariate output data, you might look at maximum plausibility or, or, or combinations, or you might look at one output at, at a time. So this is, uh, which I should thank Yanis uh, at the front here for providing these graphs. So this is um, uh, uh, sort of a simple example. So over here, we've got our observed value. So about, let's call it minus 0.6 uh, or so, with a bit of noise and a bit of extra, perhaps, error from our simulated discrepancy. So we're trying to find values on this axis, x, such that when we run through our simulator, they give us outputs kind of in that bound. Okay? And we're doing this where we've also built up an approximation of, of, of the function, perhaps it's computationally expensive. So we might have evaluated our simulator at a few points to explore the space. Okay? We've built up this approximation um, of the function everywhere. And then we're going to calculate this kind of implausibility. So we're going to have parts of the space where, even though I don't know exactly what the output is, I think it's unlikely, assuming this function is reasonably smooth, that I'm not going to get a good match. So I might have a high implausibility score here. Okay? And then we've got parts of the space where, again, we're uncertain, but we think it's possible that there could be a match. And so these have um, uh, lower scores. Now. When it's sort of presented as, as a, a one-dimensional um, example, this looks sort of suspiciously like optimization, um, and it kind of shares some things uh, in common with that. But um, when you go into higher dimensions, the, the sort of problems diverge in a bit. And in particular, um, when you're sort of working with higher dimensional outputs, okay, you might be able to look at a single output, and see that it's not going to get a good match, discard that part of the space before you even worry about what the other outputs are doing. Okay? So for higher dimensional problems, this sort of history matching approach gives you a way of breaking the problem down into sort of smaller, easier uh, tasks. So anyway, we've, got, we've thrown away part of the space. And what we might do now is put perhaps an extra simulator run where we've got the sort of lower implausibility. So we do that, and then we learn more about the function, and then we can throw away more space, and then we've got more regions where we think we might have a match. Okay? And then if we want to, we might take that forward and then do some sort of more sort of probabilistic uh, kind of uh, calibration on, on what we've got. But at the history matching stage, the, the emphasis really is just being able to throw away parts of the space where you're confident you're not going to see a match. So um, this is sort of an application of that. So this is um, uh, another um, uh, disease model. Um, and again, it's uh, Yanis at the front who sort of led the effort on this work. This is part of a um, team of us looking at this one. So this is a, a model for simulating um, HIV transmission and uh, other things and so on. Um, got a whole bunch of inputs. So this is a 22-input model. Um, most of these things actually have reasonable sort of uh, uh, physical meaning. So proportions of men and women in, under particular sort of classifications according to their sexual activity. What's the, uh, the risk of uh, transmitting HIV per sex act and things like that? Um, and then this model was calibrated to quite an intensive um, uh, cohort data set where over a sort of a um, region of 25 villages, they were sort of repeatedly surveying the population. So independently of the model, they were actually monitoring what was going on in this sort of um, uh, region of villages. Okay. And then we kind of use this sort of sequential approach of trying to throw away parts of input space where we're not, where we're not trying to find, uh, um, where we can't, don't think there'll be matches. 
So this is looking at a subset of the, uh, the inputs. We kind of look at these pairwise plots. So we might have, for a, a combination of inputs, um, we might have a whole big part of the input space with high implausibility where we're confident that you were just not going to find a match to your outputs. And then we have other parts of the space where um, we're not yet confident we can throw those away. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about what the, the blue ones mean, but you might hear about that um, later on. So we've kind of done this initial bunch of simulator runs. We've spotted regions of the space where we think we're not going to get good matches, so we put more simulator runs where we think we might get good matches. And then the, the picture becomes a little bit more refined, okay, and then we just iterate through again. Okay, and you can kind of see these non-implausible regions shrinking as we're able to throw away more and more of the input space. Okay? So at each wave, we're doing further, we're going back to our simulator, doing more runs of it, and we're learning more about how it behaves where we think we might get matches to the data. Okay? And so this is an example. This is one of, the, one of the outputs that we were trying to calibrate to. So your initial bunch of runs are mostly all hopeless, okay? but then you throw away that part of the input space, and you start to get closer and closer. And by sort of wave 10, you're starting to find you know, a decent bunch of simulator runs that are actually passing through the data. Okay? So um, this can kind of quite work quite nicely with, with high, um, high dimensional problems. Again, the main point of this is that you're not trying to calibrate everything in one go. You're just perhaps looking at one output at a time, which is easier to do, and you're just throwing away parts of the input space at a time. And as you get to a smaller, smaller space, it becomes an easier problem. OK, so um, that was the sort of UQ intro. Does anybody want to ask any questions before I um, talk about GPs? Yeah. Um, so, um, not sure if I fully understood your question, but I'll try and answer it. So, in the normal sort of Bayes calibration um, approach, you can end up with a very tight posterior, even though the model doesn't fit anything. Okay. Um, in the history matching approach, you can just throw away the whole space. You can you get a result which says this model does not fit this data uh, because you're not. In the history matching, you're not strictly trying to find matches. You're only trying to find parts of space where there isn't a match. So um, to sort of avoid being drawn into saying, I'm certain I know what the answer is, even when the model doesn't fit at all, we actually start with the history matching. So if you're in a scenario where your model just can't fit, your, your, the, end of the, the result of the analysis is to, to say the model does not fit. Not that we think we know what the answer is. Um, yeah, so you could you could overfit um, with your simulator. You could tune it so that it fits the data you've got, and then its predictions are rubbish. Um, um, I think in in um, the sort of examples that we were looking at, it was more kind of the reverse in that there's just enough data, so it's actually quite hard to find something that does fit everything. Oh, so, so you have sufficient data, but a very relatively simple simulator. Yeah. But I mean, if you're if if you're trying to fit um, with very little output data, so that then your prior on the calibration is is important, and your model discrepancy is important, because you might get a situation where your prior doesn't change very much. You say, yeah. any of them will fit. Um, I was quite interested in your, uh, the gravity one mm -hmm. related to that, and, but it, you motivated it really well, but. I wasn't convinced of the solution. You, you're not telling me that you can actually get the uh, a tr uh, a true estimate of the of the uh, of G with your experiment. Okay, so what would happen? Um, or, or were you just trying to actually find a relationship between the, the time and the true value of G? So, know. 
yeah. what we're trying to learn, so this is my, my G. Okay, that's the thing I'm trying to work out. I'm yeah. trying to find my calibration parameter to make my model fit the data. Yeah. Okay. If I if I ignore this, okay, then I become certain about the wrong value of G. How, how do you know it's the wrong value? Well, um, uh, I think that's what would happen in that case because you're not factored in error resistance. Yeah. So you'd yeah, you'd yeah. underestimate. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I've got um, I've got some error in there. But that's just my observation error. And if I keep taking lots and lots of measurements, I can kind of uh, reduce the observation error effect. Okay? But this thing, this discrepancy, I can't reduce just by taking more and more no. observations. Okay? So that potentially stops me becoming overconfident. I mean, I won't, my, my posterior won't tighten <coughs> magically on the right value. But I'll get a, rather than a, um, rather yeah, than a picture yeah, that looks yeah, like that, that, might be yeah. a bit flatter. Yeah, but um, so what's the conclusion? Uh, is it just an illustration of what discrepancy means? Or um, if you want, so the, the conclusion <laughs> is that if you want to come up, if you want your distribution to have a, a reasonable chance of at least capturing the true value, you have to have discrepancy. Right. Have to have it in there, and sometimes you even have to think a bit carefully about the shape of that discrepancy, what, that, what it might be. Okay. Right. Okay. It won't, magically, can, you, it won't it magically shift that to that. But it won't solve your problem, will it? It'll stop you being overconfident. It'll okay. stop you doing okay. bad things, but it won't okay. necessarily. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm interested to know about the, about yeah. how much work has been done in, in the situation where you have some uh, parameters x, mm -hmm. which has physical meaning, mm -hmm. but you can't observe them. Yes. So to give you some context, uh, I work uh, in application in space physics, and you have these things called diffusion coefficients or whatever in some physics-based models. Mm -hmm. They have a meaning in mm -hmm. physics terms. Right. Yeah, but you can't really observe them. Yes. But they lead uh, uncertainty in those uh, in those parameters or coefficients can mm -hmm. have diverging outputs by the simulator itself. Okay. So um, so what is it you want to do inference for those parameters, or you want to yeah, account that's, for? That's an interesting question. And apart from that, I want to know how much work has been done around this and in dealing with that. Um, so lots of work in. Um, if you if you can come up with a sort of a, a um, separately a, a distribution that represents your uncertainty about what those things are, there's lots of stuff in propagating that uncertainty through models and looking at how influential it is and, and so on. Um, if you want to learn what those those parameters are through calibrating a model to some physical data, okay, um, this sort of framework is very popular. It's been used a lot, but um, uh, it's it's uh, it's this paper that says that even with that model, if you don't think about your prior very carefully on, on this, this model doesn't work necessarily in getting you to learning about those true values. You, st you still end up learning about what values do I choose to fit the data, not what are the true values. Um, and I think specifying priors on that is very little has been done. I've also seen the problem where, uh, for example, you do try to do an analysis like this and get a posterior for what those parameters might mm -hmm. be. They might be physically infeasible. Yes, right? yes. You might get values which are very high or, or kind of negative when those x's might actually be positive strictly in, in the physics theory itself. So, at the, I mean, at the very least, um, you would, if you were sort of applying that framework, you'd have a more informative prior on what those things are, but you still might have the problem that if the model, the particular model, is not fitting the data very well, um, you get very sort of strange results from when you try and sort of invert back. Um, and again, um, I think a lot of the time people treat these things as sort of tuning inputs. They don't, they, they want their model to fit the data. So, but if they actually care about what those things mean, uh, I think there's that less work has gone into how you might specify that, that error in a way that takes you back to what the parameters are. Okay. Um, yeah. Right, so you need you need at least some proper prior specification on one, one of these things. Um, if you do it with a completely flat prior, no, it won't work because you can have any value of that and any discrepancy. And that's again problem dependent. Yes. So again, there are mistakes. Yes. And then yeah. Basically, yeah. 
so my understanding of the gut function is that, so before, like a statistician would say, okay, we've estimated this parameter given the data and given that my model is correct. Now we tend to ignore the bit where we say given that the model is correct, because when people publish nature papers on spread of TB, for example, they just say, this is my model, this is, this is what's happening. So I guess what this model is trying to do, if I'm understanding correctly, is to add more uncertainty and say, you know, the model could be incorrect as well. Yeah. The issue that I have is, put a distribution on that in practice because I mean I work in like malaria where you know we try to put the prevalence map in malaria I mean people don't report when, when they're symptomatic people you, you know we know there's a lot of missing data but whether it's 10 people or whether it's a thousand people it's actually really hard to like you know stick your finger in the air pretty much yeah that, that, yeah there's all sorts of problems here um, um, so uh, Sometimes, what you, uh, in some settings, particularly if you're, if you're interpolating, then you can sort of, if you just want to do interpolation and you don't care too much about what these things mean, then you will, then you will see how well your model is fitting the data. So the data will tell you something about this. Okay? Um, if you're just predicting, um, extrapolating, um, then you might have to rely on a sort of judgment of that, which is much, much harder. Um, uh, now, what we've tried to do in some cases is we, is we tried to sort of dig inside the models a little bit, and we've tried to look at whether there are particular assumptions that we thought, well, actually, you know, we know that assumption is not right. How much error? And then we sort of try and incorporate some of the, the probabilistically incorporate some of that error back into the model itself. But um, yeah, it's, it, this is the you know the hardest problem. Of, of, is, you, sometimes you're in the territory of unknown unknowns. Your model is your, your best understanding of the process has gone into your model, and you just don't know really what that is. So it's mainly experts. But yes, it's a judgment. It's a judgment. But a lot of analyses just assume that's zero. Okay, so you can always do better than that. Yeah. So um, generally, when you're doing this, this history matching or calibration, you're not just trying to match one target. You're trying to match several targets as well. Okay? Um, and um, uh, and one of the approaches that we, we sort of use is we say, let's just look at the first target. Okay? We'll ignore all the others, even though we've got to eventually calibrate back to those. Okay? Now, if instead of trying to find an out an input that gives me that target, if I instead search for inputs that get me too far from that target, without looking at any of the other target data, I know that that's a bad input value. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. So um, again, I think that's got a slightly different feel to it than trying to optimize directly. That's one of the things. The other thing is is that in history matching, you might explicitly say there are no matches. Yeah. As opposed to there's always going to be, if you're looking over a finite range, there's always going to be an optimum somewhere. Yeah? But there might not be any matches at all in this, in this context. Any other questions? Right, in that case, uh, sorry. Yes? I mean, you should always look at the plausibility or implausibility of the best matching input, right? Yeah. If it's too high, you say, well, it's bad. Um, is it then not, it becomes more equivalent? Uh, you have to, be a bit, have to be a little bit careful. So high implausibility means bad. Low implausibility doesn't necessarily mean good. It just means you don't yet know it's bad. Okay. But if it's the best matching? Um, well, um, uh, thing is, you can. Um, when you complete these implausibilities, you might only be looking at one of the outputs. So you don't yet know whether it matches anything else, you see. Yeah. Okay. Right, here we go. Uh, so Gaussian processes. So this is something that um, um, there's lots of interest in, um, in the sort of UQ community. And I think I've already hinted at ways that we use them. And you might guess how they're going to be used in any case. Um, I think uh, in the sort of 
computer models field, perhaps the first paper was uh, Sachs et al. in 89. Um, um, that's the first one I'm aware of anyway. Uh, and we use, the main use of, uh, of a Gaussian process is to what we call uh, emulate, and I'll explain what that word means uh, a bit later on. But for the moment, we've got a computation expensive model, so to evaluate this thing, uh, a single x takes a long time, and so perhaps we can use a Gaussian process to sort of speed up that, 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 that computation by coming up with some sort of approximation of f. So just a um, couple of features that might be a little bit di different. Um, usually we are working with deterministic um, uh, simulators f, so we don't normally have any noise in the data. Although arguably if, if, if your simulator is using numerical solvers of PDs or something like that, maybe we should incorporate some noise. But in, in theory, at least, these simulators are deterministic. So we're not going to have any noise. And um, in the era of big data, we're still very much uh, rooted in small data. The reason that we use GPs is because we can't afford to do many simulator runs. So if it were possible to get you know, millions of observations of, of, of f at different x's, then you wouldn't, for our purposes, need the GP in the first place. The reason you're doing the, using the GP is because you can't do many runs. So we're kind of more interested in how to do this with small data sets rather than how to do it with large data sets. OK, so here's the way we sort of think about the problem. So we've got some function, f. And we're going to do some analysis on that function that involves knowing the outputs at a large number of input values. Okay? So I want to know um, my function f at x1 up to x capital N. Okay? Perhaps some very large value of N. Perhaps I'm going to do some optimization, or I'm just going to want to uh, assess uncertainty as, the, as, as x changes. But I want to, whatever I'm doing, I want to know that function at a large number of, of different input values. But we're going to suppose that our function is computationally expensive, so we can only afford to do a small number of runs. So maybe I can afford to get these points here, but I'd like to know what's going on in between. Okay? So just looking at that picture, and even if you didn't know anything about Gaussian processes, you could say, well, pretty sure I could fit some sort of curve or approximation to that curve through those points, okay? and then use that as a, an approximation as, as a surrogate for f. But what we'd particularly like to do, as well as being able to estimate what these outputs are, we want to quantify uncertainty in our estimate. We'd like to know, for example, what would happen if we could afford to do further runs of the simulator. So if I could perhaps get a slightly bigger sample of data there, how might my estimates change? So it's important that we quantify uncertainty in these estimates too. So we think of this as a statistical inference problem. We're going to treat f as an uncertain function, okay? not because it's been randomly generated from any distribution. It's not a sample of anything. It's just something that's unknown to us. Before we go to our computer and we plug in an x value, we don't know what the value of the output is going to be. So we're uncertain about it. And then what we're going to do is derive a probability distribution for that entire function given the, uh, the, the points that we're able to do able to evaluate. Okay? So um, people use the, the word emulator in slightly different ways. When we talk about an emulator, we mean specifically a probability distribution for a function. So an emulator is a distribution for a function. Some people use emulator to refer to it as an approximation of the function, but we, we sort of go a bit more general than that. Okay? Now, whatever distribution we're going to use, it has to be a subjective judgment. Okay? There is no true probability distribution for f because People don't build um, models of the Earth's climate by, by sampling from a, a, po a population of models. Okay? So there's no true distribution here. It's just a, a judgment that we're going to use. Okay? And a uh, popular choice of that distribution, F, is the Gaussian process. Okay? So that kind of hopefully motivates our particular interest in Gaussian processes in this context. So let's talk about probability distributions for functions. So uh, we'll start with the univariate normal or Gaussian distribution. I think I've almost used the same notation as Neil. Um, did you have an M and V, or did you have? Anyway, almost the same notation, but I think it's going to diverge later on. Um, so here's a 
We all know this, the standard normal distribution. And then we can move from normal to multivariate normal. So here we've got a bivariate normal distribution. Okay. So we specify in terms of a vector of means, M, and a covariance matrix V. Okay. So again, we've got all nice properties that these marginal distributions of Z1 and Z2 are normal, but now we're looking at our joint distribution because we've got quite strong positive correlation there. So we're saying that Z1 and Z2 are likely to be large together or small together. Okay. So we've got univariate, we've got multivariate, and then the Gaussian process it's just really an extension of the multivariate normal distribution. Okay, so a Gaussian process we define to be an infinite collection of random variables such that any subset have a, a finite subset have a multivariate normal. So you can think of a Gaussian process as nothing more than an infinite dimensional multivariate normal distribution. So kind of a way to sort of think about what's going on here. So we've got a, a function and I'm modeling this function as a Gaussian process. Okay? So we can think of this function. I've got infinitely many choices of x. So I've got infinitely many outputs to consider. So that's my infinite set of vari random variables. And then we're saying that if we take any finite subset, so if I choose two particular input values, x1 and x2, and I look at their output, so this is f of x1 here and f of x2 there, if I look at that joint distribution of f of x1 and f of x2, that's what I've plotted here. So that joint distribution of f of x1, f of x2, would have a bivariate normal. Okay. So um, one thing to sort of spot is that we've got x1 and x2 are quite close together. Okay. If I assume that my function is kind of reasonably smooth, so it's not wiggling about too crazily, x1 and x2 are quite close. I'm expecting f of x1 and f of x2 to be quite close to each other, and so you can kind of see that correlation here. Okay kind of particular realizations of that function, samples of that function, f of x1 and f of x2 might be sort of both big or, or both small. Okay. Okay. Um, now this is where I have to be a little bit careful. Um, so Neil hinted at this. There's a slightly different way of talking about Gaussian processes and it can kind of seem like we're doing things differently but we're not really. Okay. So the way I'm going to present a GP looks a little bit different to what Neil did, okay, and this is through this this thing called the the, the mean function. Okay, um, it's only superficial. It looks different, but we're not actually doing anything different. So you can just give me a uh, bear with me a little bit, and I'll sort of uh, show you kind of how they're equivalent and why some of us like to think in terms of mean functions anyway. Okay, so if this looks different to what Neil's talking about, it isn't really. It's just presented in a slightly different way. So the way we're going to write this is that we're going to say our function is given by this term here, okay, which we call the mean function, plus uh, a Gaussian process. So m is the mean function, and that's going to be uh, a parametric function of x. Okay? So it um, could be a polynomial, but really any par parametric function of x. If it's linear, uh, it's going to be expressed in terms of these betas here. If we express something that's linear in the betas, then that makes the analysis easy and we can integrate them out. Okay? And then z is going to be a zero mean Gaussian process. Okay? So um, kind of what we're doing here is we're uh, using uh, the Gaussian process is describing the departure of our actual function f from that mean function n. Okay? So there's sort of different ways of thinking about this. Um, one way to think about it is that n might be your favorite parametric regression model. And because f is deterministic, maybe your parametric regression model can't quite capture f perfectly. And so z is improving or correcting that parametric regression model. Okay? So we're kind of using Gaussian processes to make um, parametric models a little bit better. Um, because we're dealing with deterministic functions here that we that we know should pass, we want our sort of um, interpolation to pass through all the points. Okay, so we have to specify z. So z is going to have a zero mean. So the thing we have to specify is this covariance function. So it's fairly similar to I think where uh, where Neil was writing it. 
So we've got these two parameters in this particular one-dimensional case, um, delta and sigma squared. So sigma squared is describing how far your function f deviates from the mean. So if you're kind of doing this with a zero mean, sigma squared is kind of describing the sort of range of the, 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 the function, deviation from zero, if you like. And then delta describes sort of how wiggly uh, the function looks. Okay, So if I consider the covariance of f of xi with itself, so if I've got xi and xj equal, um, I've got uh, um, zero here, and I've just got a, uh, the variance of f of xi is just sigma squared. Okay. As xi and xj move apart, that um, covariance correlation gets weaker. And delta is describing sort of how weakly, how, how quickly it decays as you, as you move apart. Okay. So just some sort of examples. So we'll consider the same value of sigma squared um, um, in both cases. I've got a zero mean in, in this case. So, uh, so sigma is root 10. So you're kind of ex expecting the sort of function to vary roughly between sort of 10 minus 10. So I've got two values of delta. So you can see as I'm making delta larger, I'm getting these sort of smoother looking realizations um, of the function. Um, here we'll keep delta the same I'll make sigma squared larger so now I'm expecting the function to sort of vary between about plus or minus 20 okay um, uh, and um, again we'll keep sigma squared fixed we'll make delta bigger and we get things that look smoother okay now this kind of highlights one sort of problem is that you can kind of see as as you make sigma squared larger with the same value of delta, things start to potentially look a bit more wiggly. So when it comes to inference later on, there is sort of potential, some potentially identifiability problems between delta and sigma squared. So the likelihood surfaces for these models aren't always um, uh, uh, so nice. You have to be a little bit careful with that. OK, so just to sort of bring this back to um, um, the way that Neil was presenting the GP, so let's suppose we've got a, a, a function, a uh, scalar input x, and I'm going to write it like this. So this is going to be my mean function here, simple x beta term, and then z is going to be my zero mean Gaussian process as before. Okay? And we're going to, uh, beta is uncertain, so I'm going to put a normal distribution prior on that beta. So I'm going to use a conjugate prior here. Um, so beta given sigma squared is normally distributed, mean zero. Okay? So if I consider uh, what's the expectation of f, okay? so the expectation of this term for any x is going to be 0 because beta has expectation 0. And this is a 0 mean Gaussian process. So for any x, the expectation of f is 0. Okay? Then if I consider the covariance between two um, f's, okay? so we'll treat these two terms as independent. So I'm going to have a covariance between x1 beta and x2 beta. Okay. So that comes out to be this term here. And then we've got the covariance in the Gaussian process between the two terms, which comes out here. Okay. So the point is, what I could have done is rather than specifying hierarchically this mean and then this prior on the mean, I could have jumped straight to saying that my Gaussian process has a zero mean with this particular covariance function. And if I do that, get exactly the same model. Okay? So this is why the sort of um, convention in sort of machine learning literature is to have a zero mean GP, but then extra terms in the covariance function, and those correspond to the sort of thing that you might have done, you might have put in your mean function. Um, so there was a question earlier about um, can you put a trend in a Gaussian process? Okay? Um, so yes, you can. Either you might specify it directly in this hierarchical framework, or equivalently, you can have an extra term in your covariance function, which is equivalent to saying that you think there's a trend in that model. Okay? Now, we tend to go a little bit further. Um, when we do this, um, we usually use an improper prior, so we let our variance tend to infinity. Um, but you actually get the same result again. Um, uh, if you drop the v term, um, it kind of boils down to the same. Um, 
the, the same sort of posterior Gaussian process. So there really is, in practice, no difference between these two things. They're just different ways of, of, of writing the model. Um, but I'll, I'll say a bit more about the sort of mean function later on. So just to summarize then, um, for sort of standard modeling choices, if you have a GP with a particular mean function, there's a way of rewriting that as zero mean with a slightly more complex covariance kernel. So they're not really any, there's no real difference. So which of those two ways you choose to write it doesn't matter because it gives you the same model. Um, but what is important is how you choose that covariance uh, kernel or equivalently how you choose the mean function. So in particular, when we will talk a bit later about different ways that you might choose your mean, you can just reinterpret that as, as a discussion of how you, how you might be choosing the, the covariance kernel. OK, so here's an example to sort of see how this works. So we've got, a, again, a one-dimensional example. Um, I'm going to specify the sort of parametric mean here and this particular choice of, of covariance function. So I haven't got any uncertain parameters in this, in this model. Then what I want to do, if I want to consider um, the distribution of my function f at three different x values, so at 0, 0 0.1, and 1, if I've assumed that my f has a Gaussian process, I've specified my mean and covariance functions, and that says that the joint distribution of these three output values, f of 0, 0 0.1, and 1, will be multivariate normal, with mean given by the mean function evaluated at these three x's, and covariance matrix derived from my covariance function. Okay, so I've got one is down the diagonal. I'm having covariance of xi with itself. You can see the um, first two points have quite a strong correlation because they're close to each other. But these points are further apart, so these, correla these correlations are weaker. So that's, that's your correlation between f of x1 and f of, x, f of x3 and f of x2 and f of x3. And they're weaker because they're further apart. OK, so. Um, why do we like do using a Gaussian process? Okay. So here's the setup. We've observed our function at endpoints. So we'd like to know what the function is doing at other input values. So maybe we've got observed the red, the red circles, the, the, the blue circles. We'd like to predict these red circles, but we, ha we haven't observed them. So we're uncertain about these red circles here. Okay. So what we can do is we string together all these outputs into a single vector. So we're going to put them all together. Okay. So why is the combination of the points that I have observed and the points that I would like to predict? We've already decided that we're going to represent uncertainty about this function with a Gaussian process. So by the definition of a Gaussian process, the joint distribution of the points I've seen and the points I haven't seen is multivariate normal. Okay with a mean vector and a covariance matrix that will drop out of whatever I've chosen for my mean and covariance functions. Okay. And then we use this nice partitioning property of uh, multivariate normals. So we've said that this joint distribution is multivariate normal. We're now, we're now going to partition the mean into the mean for y1 and the mean for y2. We'll partition the covariance matrix into a covariance matrix for y1, covariance for y2, and then cross covariances between y and y2. Okay? And then the nice result is that the conditional distribution of the points that you haven't seen, given the points that you have seen, is another multivariate normal. Okay? And we've got these nice expressions for the posterior mean and the posterior variance. So this is the expectation of y2 given y1 and the variance covariance matrix of y2 given y1. So if any PhD students here, and you're using a Gaussian process in your work, and your examiner says to you, why are you using a Gaussian process? Um, I would just say, because of these equations. Okay? Um, <laughs> if we didn't have nice equations, I don't think anybody would be using them. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of it is to do with retractability, the fact that you can get a nice closed form expression for the mean and the covariance. So you can see we've got the, the observations entering here, um, but otherwise nothing that's uncertain. So if, if you were doing this with a the zero mean and a more cons complex covariance kernel, these m's are zero, so that takes you back to the expression that uh, Neil showed you. Uh, we've just kind of got this extra term here. So 
So I haven't got a slide for this, but if I just sort of show you what's sort of going on, way to think about this. It's all wicked. Okay, so you've got some observations. Okay. So if you're using this mean function form, a way to think about it is that you might have some trend. Okay. And then it's these it's these departures from that trend that are, are modeled as normal random variables. Okay. So this term here kind of corresponds to these 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 residuals, these departures from the trend this trend. And then when you come to predict at a new value, okay, when you come to predict at a new value, what you're doing is you're saying, well, first of all, where would I be according to the trend? And then you're, then you're kind of looking at, well, how, how far did the function stray from that trend in that area? So you, you're kind of looking at that, that residual there. So you're saying, well, perhaps something's going to be a little bit uh, a similar looking residual over there. Okay. If you've done this with a zero mean, um, kind of a way to think about it is that you just get, uh, so let's try and draw the same points roughly. If you kind of were doing this with a zero mean, you just get slightly bigger residuals. Okay? So in that sense, you kind of get to the same place um, whether you're putting in the, me the, the mean or not. OK, so the reason we like using Gaussian processes is because it's easy both to come up with a prediction for y2 and to quantify uncertainty um, given the, the points on the function that you're able to observe. Okay? So just a sort of little illustration of this. So we're going to start off with a, uh, um, a prior distribution on f. So each line is showing a sort of realization from that prior. Then we run our model. And we've got an observation. So at this value of x, we've run the model simulator. We know what the output is. Okay. So now we've got our posterior distribution. So now we've got no uncertainty about the output at, at that point. So all these realizations pass through that point. And you can see the uncertainty grows as you move away from that training input. Okay. And then we'll get another point. And again, that's kind of giving us fairly tight uncertainty in between those points, which grows as you move out. And you sort of keep going, and you kind of see that it sort of adapts quite nicely. So this, in this example, the at red line was the, the true function that I was using to produce the points. And you've kind of got uh, a mean that's very close and kind of generally very little uncertainty. It just starts to grow as you move out the range. OK, so just a sort of uh, illustration of the sort of performance that you might get. So this is a, a simulator. This is a fairly simple climate simulator. It had 18 different inputs. Uh, we had 255 training runs. So what you're seeing here is for a bunch of validation runs, um, maybe this was cost validation, I can't remember, you've got the prediction and a 95% range from your emulator. So generally, this is the line y equals x. So generally, the predictions are reasonably good, and the intervals are, uh, are fairly tight. So for nicely behaved models, this can work quite well. But for, it doesn't always work so well. OK, so the sort of benefit for this is that the guy using the simulator, they run it as often as they can, typically with a small sample. We use the emulator, the Gaussian process, to predict at all the other points that we're interested in. Those predictions we can get once we've fitted our emulator very quickly and get the uncertainty. And it makes it possible to do analyses even if you can't actually run your simulator many times, okay, as long as your emulator is reasonable. And there are other things that you might hear about later on in, this, in the workshop, other properties of Gaussian processes that, that uh, are nice. So for example, if I've got uh, an uncertain input x with some distribution, and I want to know what would the expected value of my output be, okay? um, technically it's conditional on f, so I'm looking at kind of an average of the output as I uh, vary the inputs. Um, one of the nice properties of Gaussian process is that what you've got here is basically just a linear combination of lots of normal random variables. So this quantity is also normally distributed. And for certain modeling assumptions, you can, you can actually write out uh, an expression for the mean and variance of that integral. Okay? Similarly for derivatives, you can get nice sort of you can do nice things with derivatives and integrals of, of Gaussian processes. Just one comment that put some people's mind at rest. Some people think what you're doing is you're taking some 
complex model that someone spent years developing and throwing it away and replacing it with a, a Gaussian process. We're not doing that. Okay? The idea is you want to know your um, output at lots of input values. Okay? What you have to work with is whatever your uncertainty is about the points you cannot afford to run given the, the points you have. So there's kind of no way of getting away from this is that there are going to be points that you don't know and points that you do. And it's the emulator that's giving this, 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 this distribution here. Okay? But if we're working with a, a deterministic simulator, the emulator always replicates the points that you've got. So it never changes what the, the, the results that you've got from the simulator. It's just filling in the gaps. OK, just um, a few more things about the mean function. And again, you can think of this in terms of choosing your covariance kernel, if that's how you prefer to do it, if you have a zero mean. Now, in our sort of context, we're working with quite um, uh, small data sets over quite large input spaces. So you can actually have, find that even when you're interpolating, that you've got very large gaps. If you imagine a, that was an 18-dimensional climate model we had, 255 points. 255 points is not big in an 18-dimensional space. So when you come to interpolate, you might find you're actually almost extrapolating in some sense. So that often you find that your emulator can actually revert to whatever you've chosen here. Okay? Um, so this is, this is actually for extrapolation. Um, so actually ignore that one for the moment. So this is a, an emulator which, over the region of the training data, is, is is um, um, predicting quite nicely, but when we start to extrapolate. So this one had a, I think, it had a, a linear mean. Okay, so the extrapolation it just kind of reverts back to that linear mean there. This function had a zero mean, and again that just reverts back to um, uh, the zero mean. Okay. Now, again, you might think that sort of well, that's fine. We just won't extrapolate. But if you're working in higher dimensional input spaces. Um, in a sense, you may well be extrapolating um, in the sense that your, the gaps between your points can get very big and it will revert to potentially the choice of, of mean function. So you either need to think carefully about the mean that you use or equivalently more carefully about what covariance kernel you're going to use. Um, practice, we tend to use quite a simple linear form. We can deal with all these beta's analytically, so that's not really changing the model itself. Some people prefer a constant mean anyway, um, and then uh, you'll hear later, sometimes it's best to work with even higher order polynomial terms. Sometimes we've got more than one simulator. So you might have uh, a fast simulator that you can run quickly, um, as well as a slow simulator. So you might actually use your fast simulator as that prime mean. So you can kind of build in um, information from multiple sources. Um, other people will use um, uh, another GP for the mean function, perhaps something with um, noise, a bit smoother, and that can kind of pick out non-stationarity. That's, again, sort of equivalent to having a more sort of complex covariance kernel in your Gaussian process. And I think, again, you'll perhaps hear about that more in, in Nicolas' talk. Um, final technical point, so I'm not going to say too much about this. So in general, if we're working with correlation function, and we might have a, a different choice, but again, this is quite popular. We can integrate out our sigma squared, which I've dropped out the front, so we've got a, a variance parameter sigma squared that drops out analytically, but the deltas, there's no nice way of dealing with those. Um, a lot of people use maximum likelihood for this, that's perhaps, and that's perhaps the main effort in fitting your emulator, it's just repeatedly evaluating the likelihood function. Some people do um, kind of full MCMC on those parameters to account for their uncertainty. Some people just fix them um, and have a more sort of complex um, uh, mean structure because um, that can be easier to deal with. Uh, and then there's um, uh, some authors here who use a sort of, an, a sort of a faster important sampling approach, again as a way of including um, uncertainty in the deltas. So again, this is just something that we find quite helpful. So just go back to that climate model. Um, eventually, we just plug in the best sort of maximum likelihood estimate. But we found running a Gibbs sampler to start with is just a good way of taking a kind of a more arbitrary starting value and at least trying to move into regions of high likelihood. If you directly apply optimizer, then it can be a bit more uh, sensitive to, to your starting value. So kind of a combination of 
something stochastic to find a good starting point and then an optimizer just to finish it off um, works quite well. Right, um, so that's just that end of time, I think. So quick summary then. So the UQ, lots of interesting problems to do with using deterministic models. So models that themselves have no uncertainty statement, capturing the uncertainties of interest. Talked about propagating uncertainty, sensitivity analysis, calibration. There are other things as well that people do. This is not an exhaustive list, but there are certainly some example of interesting problems. And the, the hardest part, which I think came out in the, in the question, questions, was this business of dealing with uh, discrepancy, how you model the fact that your simulator is not perfect. Then Gaussian processes, very popular for dealing with computationally expensive simulators, um, as I've sort of shown you. Um, something I haven't really talked about, but the um, problem of diagnostics is very important, and, and knowing whether or not the Gaussian sort of assumption for the um, if you like, uh, deviation of the function from the mean or whatever is okay. So that's uh, another kind of important area in, in validating that the Gaussian process is a sensible model for your, for your data points. Okay, I'll stop there. Any more questions on any of that? Yeah. Um, lots of so um, lots of stuff that's called sort of a, a Bayesian emulator isn't really Bayesian. Well, okay, there's two things going on here. The idea of representing the function with a distribution is naturally Bayesian. It doesn't have a frequentist interpretation. So you can interpret the whole thing as Bayesian whether you're using dice Krieging or whatever. Okay. The parameter estimation, people who would have referred to it as a Bayesian emulator, quite often are still using maximum likelihood. And there's, that's, 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 as I understand it, that's basically what the, 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 the Krieging model is doing anyway. Um, so the question really is, I, I'd say, is it worth using something like MCMC to deal with correlation parameters? Um, and sometimes it won't get, get you much benefit. Occasionally, I think it probably is worthwhile, particularly with smaller data sets where I think maximum likelihood is a bit flaky. But if you... If you, as long as you've validated your emulator, you've seen that it's predicting OK and that its uncertainty statements are reasonably well calibrated, I don't think it really matters. And certainly I would expect uh, Krieging to, Dice Krieging to, to do a good job, lots of cases. Okay, um, so the first thing about the design points, uh, yes, we use space filling, that's in the hypercube. You can combine that with an input distribution. So rather than sampling from a uniform, you might sample from your distribution anyway. Um, and maybe just stretch it out a little bit so that you're kind of covering, covering the ends. Uh, now, the second question about um, should you include some noise in the, in the emulator to represent discrepancy? Um, I'd prefer not to in the sense that keep these things separate. So use the emulator to represent what the, func the function is doing based on the points you've got. Separately, when you predict, have an error term for discrepancy. But I think if you merge them together, that might confuse the issue sometimes. But you might have noise in your emulator if your function is using numerical solvers that you think are, have errors in them. So then there's kind of an then your emulator is trying to predict what the solver, what a perfect solver would give. If you see what I mean. Yeah. 
Uh, is this in the emulator problem? Um, yeah, so I haven't, um, um, I haven't really talked about it, but there are various diagnostic checks that you should do. Um, I mean, the very simple one is sort of leave one out cross validation. Okay? Um, that's not always very reliable if you're working with smaller data sets. The sort of gold standard is to have a separate validation data, and then there are particular diagnostics that you can do to check the Gaussian assumptions and the correlation assumptions. Um, so that's an important part of it, but I haven't said very much about it here. Any, yeah? Uh, what if you want this not be stochastic? Stochastic. Um, so um, uh, you might actually hear about that a, a bit later. Um, so there are we've done this with stochastic models where um, uh, the models do kind of internal Monte Carlo simulations um, to produce outputs. Um, and it's reasonably straightforward to build that error in. Um, or you can just, in any case, include an extra error to represent the fact that your model is not deterministic. Um, in a sense, that's the more traditional um, regression problem. It's regression with noisy data. So um, it's, very, it's reasonably straightforward to modify your covariance kernel or whatever to incorporate a stochastic model. And depending on the nature of your stochastic model, you might be able to be quite precise about how you do that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for listening. And uh, we'll take any other discussion questions.